My name is Ari Lee. I am an interdisciplinary artist, which means that I make work in lots of different media. Right now I'm making work in video and digital things, so things on computers, and weavings, so textiles. I think I always was an artist, and it just took me a very long time to realize that. I grew up and I had some really wonderful art teachers and really loved taking art classes, but I kind of felt like I should be doing something that was more practical as work, and I found work in graphic design and in later in the computer industry, working as a web designer and then a user experience designer. And then I went back to school for graphic design and I got an MFA in it. Slowly, I began to realize that all these things that I was doing kind of in my spare time, on weekends, at night, these little sort of personal projects for me were more than just a hobby and it's really what I felt like I almost had like a calling to do. I began to shift my practice from graphic design and user experience design and started becoming more serious about making artwork as my full focus. And then a few years ago, I made the shift from going from a full-time job and working on my art practice uh, nights and weekends, and I started consulting instead. And so I work more part-time, and then I have more time to focus on my art practice. I was approached by the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco a few years ago to work on something with them, for them, and their only parameters that had to do, it had to address either the museum collection or the museum's location or something about the museum. So it had to engage with the museum in some way. And so I took that as an opportunity to really delve into, into their collection and look at what they had. And I, surprisingly enough, even though I'm Asian American, I have almost no education in Asian art because when I went to school, if you were interested in art history, you took the history of art from prehistory to the Renaissance, and then the course art history from the Renaissance to the present. And there was almost no non-Western, non-European art in that class. So when I went into the Asian Art Museum, I was looking at all these things. Some of them I recognized as being similar to things I would see, like, like my parents had a vase that looked sort of like some of the vases there, or like at my other Korean American friends' houses, maybe they would have like a screen painting that looks sort of like some of the things in the museum. But I really had no understanding of what I was looking at other than this sort of familiarity with them. And then I got to this one section that had these pieces that were just beautiful. There are these objects that are called bajagis. They're kind of like quilts. I learned later that they're made out of little pieces of leftover material from other projects around the house. And they can be very geometric, like this one. Yeah, this one's made all out of triangles. Or they can be made of lots of little random shapes, kind of like the way this one is. They're just beautiful. They're about maybe this big usually. And they're just used for ordinary household things, like before it's time to eat, if there's food on the table, people might, a woman might put a bajagi over like a, a dish of food before it's time to eat, or if you're putting away like blankets after the winter, you might wrap them up, you tie them up in a bajagi and, and put them away. And they weren't really looked at as art objects, but these women would make these beautiful bajagis and mothers would make a whole bunch of bajagis to give their daughters before their daughters got married. And then when their daughters got married, they would go to their husband's household, which often was very far away They'd very rarely get to see their original families again. But these bajagis became like this little piece of home that they brought with them. These bajagis might have a little piece of fabric that's left over from somebody's dress or from something else. And it would be like a reminder of where they came from and then like a, a physical, touchable connection to their, their original families. And I thought that was just such a beautiful story. And these objects are so beautiful that I decided to make a video that um, was a modern equivalent of a bajagi.
One of the curators that I was working with at the Asian Art Museum told me about this archive of Asian American family home movies that was in the Bay Area, and I was fascinated. And so he put me in touch with the person, with the contact at the archive. And so through them, I was able to look at all these home movies that they had collected from Asian American families from the 1920s through the 1980s. It was really moving for me to be able to look at all these home movies. Growing up as an Asian American in the 70s and 80s, there weren't a lot of depictions of Asian Americans in the media. Like, if you watch a TV show, there is never an Asian American on TV or in the movies. All these images of common everyday kinds of things like birthday parties or picnics or family gatherings, you know, like the kind of common image that one would have in your head is of a Caucasian family doing these things. And for me, that was actually the case too, which is crazy because my personal experience was of my Asian American, my Korean American family doing these things. But then looking at this archive, seeing all these other Asian American families doing those things, you know, going on family vacations to Yosemite and having an Easter, Easter egg hunt or doing all those stupid races at the church picnic, you know, doing all these things that I did too and many people across America have done, but seeing Asian Americans do it was so validating for me. And it felt very affirming, and it felt like I, you know, I'm part of this common experience too. It was really reward rewarding to see that. I think everybody has the same thing in them that is what it is that makes me an artist. I think everybody has a potential, has artistic potential within them, but some people choose to devote their life practice to it, and other people choose to put their energy primarily towards other things. For me personally, I would wish that everyone would be able to have access to this part of themselves that's an, an inner artist, and to be creative, to see things, to see life from that perspective that is a little bit outside of the everyday, and to see maybe the bigger picture, or to see the details that make things really beautiful and enriching. So this piece, this is called Ada, named after a woman, Ada Lovelace, who wrote the first computer program. And when I was making this piece, I wanted to make something that was sort of like a punch card, but was a weaving. And I had a bunch of different ideas. This is a punch card, or a picture of a punch card. And it's something that's used in old-fashioned computers from the 1960s, like 50s, 60s, and 70s. And it's a piece of cardboard that has a bunch of punched holes in it and it gives the computer instructions. And actually the first computers used punch cards because the designers of the first computers saw that weaving looms used punch cards. I got really curious as to what I was spending all my time on all day long. And I mean this is crossed my mind many times in my life, but I decided I was going to actually find out. So I created a spreadsheet and I decided on a bunch of different categories to divide my time into. I had about six or seven different categories that I felt like encompassed every possible thing I could be doing during a common day. Then I started keeping track of what I was doing. So at first I just printed out like a blank timesheet and started filling in all these different categories by hand as I was going through my day. And then I realized, wait a second, I can just do this in a spreadsheet document on my phone. So then I just started doing it on my phone. And so I had different categories for sleep, personal care, food, housework, household management, childcare, volunteer work, art practice, consulting, and leisure. After I had about a month of, actually I think it was close to two months of data, I decided to take one week, which I felt like was sort of representative of a typical week, 
and try to visualize it. So then first, I just created this grid on um, graph paper. So like my day would start at 6 a.m. and I followed through until midnight and each of these squares was the equivalent of 15 minutes. And so like one column would represent one day and then another day. And so this was one whole week of what I did with my time. And then when I had that visualization, I started playing around with different ways of coloring it in, coding it. I made it like a bunch of different, different colorways. I tried bright, kind of rainbow. I tried, I tried making a representation of what different weave structures would look like in there with different kinds of yarns that I was testing out. And then I actually made a small test piece, which is actually right over here. Like this is, this corresponds to that other piece that I showed you that had the little bits of thread on the bottom. So that was one way I was thinking about doing it. And then this piece here is actually another one. I was trying it with just different kinds of textures of off-white. And then the final form I settled on was seven separate weavings, one for each day of the week. And I decided on a color palette that I liked and yarns that I was going to stick with. And then I came up with this, with this whole grid that represented the weaving that I was going to be making. And so I had the key here with the different yarns I had picked for each of these categories. And then I just wove according to this plan. And I literally taped it up on my loom and followed it and measured with a ruler as I went along to create each of these weavings. So the final form this weaving took was seven weavings, each one representing one day of the week. So there's like some set increment that denotes the amount of time that I spent on each activity. And then, and then this one's a close up that shows you the different categories that I tracked my time into. And then you can see a little bit of a detail of one of the, the weavings. Weaving is made by taking a series of threads, holding them taut, and then interlacing another set of threads over and under in the opposite perpendicular direction. So these threads are called the warp threads, and they're held under tension by the loom. And then if I lift them, I can pass a thread in the perpendicular direction. This one's called a weft thread. And it goes over some of these warp threads and under some of these warp threads. And then when I press it into place, when I beat it into place, it forms the next row of weaving. And then if you look at the surface of the weaving, you can see that at any point on this weaving, you can only see either a warp thread on top or a weft thread on top. And that's analogous in a computer to a zero or a one in a computer bit. So under, um, like this is a drawing that represents the warp threads and the weft threads in a weaving with the weft threads going over and under different warp threads. And it's represented on paper in a draft pattern for weavers like this. And you can see it is a lot like a grid of pixels. It very much is the same kind of thing. And so that kind of speaks to the binary nature of weaving. It is that very binary nature of weaving that was exploited when punch cards were, which were used as a mechanism for determining which warp threads were to be lifted in a very complex pattern. When those punch cards were then adopted by the designers of the first computers as an input method for computers. 
because the punch card exploits that binary nature of weaving. Each hole of the punch card represents a warp thread, and if there's a hole present, then a warp thread gets lifted. If there's no hole, it stays down. And in the same in a punch card for a computer, the hole represents either on or an off. So it's like a computer bit. A little personal backstory. Before I devoted myself full time to art practice, or most time, I'm still doing other things like consulting and being a parent. Um, I was working as a user experience designer in Silicon Valley, and I was working crazy hours. You know, Silicon Valley is notorious for very little work-life balance, but you know, you get paid well, and I felt like that was a worthwhile trade-off. Then I had my daughter, and I went from working crazy hours in a Silicon Valley office setting to working crazy hours as a stay-at-home parent, but making nothing. And in our society, value is associated with the amount of money that you work. So by making, working all this, all, working all this time as a stay-at-home parent, you know, being up all, at all hours, not having a break, and all that entails, was not, but not being paid. It was, it, it felt like I was not valued by society. It was a very strange reversal of my situation from before. Um, and ultimately, it's probably more important for me to raise a child, to create a human being, to make sure this person um, reaches their full potential than it is for me to do any other job that I might get paid for. But that's not reflected in what I'm paid or what society um, deems appropriate for, um, like if I were to retire, uh, I would only get social security benefits for the the work that I put in in like my office jobs, but not for the time that I put in raising a child and creating another contributing member of society. So that was a very interesting reality to find myself in. So in creating this artwork that represents all this un, unremuner, unremunerated, un, um, undervalued labor, I felt like I was turning all this labor into a product, a thing, an artwork that has cultural value and potentially monetary value as well. This book is fascinating. Okay. This book, More Work for Mother, it talks about how um, with the rise of industrialization, um, so you know, back in, say, pioneer days, a household with a man and a woman and children would divide the labor and women had certain things that they tended to do, men had other things they tended to do, everybody contributed to the household to make it run and to contribute to their survival. Everybody was essential. Then, with the Industrial Revolution, some parts of the labor that men were called upon to do were industrialized and so then things like chopping firewood were unnecessary because everybody had a stove or you know, the equivalent of that in their house, and so you just need to buy coal. So all these things that were traditionally done by men were industrialized, and then you could just buy the tools or materials you needed to have those things provided for in your household. And then the men started going out and finding work elsewhere because they could, and then bringing home a wage. And that became associated with, well, what is, what's a val valuable use of your time if you're bringing in money by doing wage work. And this, this book goes on about how that kept happening, but there is no industrialization of the work that women did, like the laundry or childcare or things like that. But and when there was, like when washing machines became common in a house, then it was expected that everybody would have clean clothes every day. Instead of having one day when all the clothes were washed, Everybody had to wear a clean outfit every single day, so the expectation rose. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how much that thinking has shifted over like 100 or 200 years. Yeah. Well, I feel like with the pandemic, at least now, 
people are thinking about the value of care work and the value of things that were just, you don't even really think about as essential, like working at a grocery store. You know, the, the, anything that contributes to getting food into households and like cooking and childcare and teaching, like all those things. Now you can't ignore how important those things are. And taking care of sick people, like how important is that? I feel like we've all been rolling with this and I kind of accepted that my art practice was just gonna be slower, just like everything else was just gonna be a little bit slower once the pandemic started. I think I've come to terms with that, but it's not gonna last forever and I'm trying to see that this is a good time to have more one-on-one -on -one time with my daughter, have a lot of family time and really enjoy those moments that we normally wouldn't really savor, like the, the walks in the neighborhood and the bike rides and these really simple things that can get overlooked when we have so many opportunities to do everything in this city.